We are pleased to host um, Kalina Raskin. She is, uh, you know, we have mostly uh, people coming from the academic side, also practitioners. She is a CEO of CBOs. Uh, uh, I will, I uh, will, will, I will uh, explain. Will, I will explain. <laughs> no worries. Uh, she will talk about biomimicry. Uh, sorry, I thought it was biomimetism. In, uh, yeah, it's English, but Anyway, so thank you very much for being here. You have an hour, then you have questions. So yes, less, just uh, remember that I have to leave at a little earlier to get my train. When, when? At six. Six. So okay, so you can do you'll minutes. be released earlier on Friday evening. I guess this is okay for you. No, I'd like to be longer. Yeah, sure. So, so hi everyone. So I'm Kalina. So my background is in engineering, physics, and chemistry. Then I did a PhD in biology, and uh, I decided to get involved into this field called biomimicry. I'll be talking about for a few minutes. Uh, going and uh, I've been uh, passionate about this topic for the last 13 years now and I found in biomimicry, biomimicry uh, the congruence between let's say my intellectual interest for sciences and interdisciplinary sciences and also my will to be involved into addressing uh, ecological transition and adaptation to climate change. So that's uh, what I'll be talking about. Who has ever heard about biomimicry? Okay, can you give me any examples? Oh, no, I'll stay here, sorry. <laughs> you need to stay here. Okay, yep. Uh, there is a building in Zimbabwe, Africa, which is inspired by term termite mounds. So like uh, ventilation is like, constructed in that way that it allows Yes, I will repeat that for uh, for uh, for the video. Indeed, there are, there are uh, there are, there is an example about uh, about uh, inspiration in the building and architectural sector, uh, inspired from the um, termite molds and uh, and ventilation, uh, because indeed in these African areas you can have a very wide range of temperatures. Uh, between uh, during the night it can reach almost to zero and during the day 40 to 50 degrees and in these areas termites are able to build three to four meters high termite molds it's not like the small termite mold probably uh, some of you are used to it's the very high one uh, and uh, uh, they are able to stabilize the inter internal temperature of the mold at 25 degrees 25 degrees because they live in symbiosis uh, with uh, mushrooms they cultivate and these mushrooms are uh, growing optimally at 25 degrees and so they found a way to ventilate very efficiently uh, the, the, uh, the, the termite mold so that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's quite adapted to this uh, wide range of climates and so the architect uh, Mick Pierce uh, decided to get inspired from the I won't go into details about the um, different uh, uh, holes that they have both on the roof uh, of the mold and both they have like um, I don't know if you know there is there is a technique to cool down buildings which are called I think in English Canadian wells so they are, there are tunnels uh, that you pu put under the ground and so the hot air comes uh, in uh, in the ground get cool uh, cooled uh, in the ground and then uh, you can fresh fresh the building. So the termites in invented this like uh, centuries, uh, uh, centuries ago and this is what Mick Pierce did. Another example? Eiffel Tower. Hmm? Eiffel Tower. The Eiffel Tower? Yes, the story says uh, that uh, Gustave Eiffel indeed looked at the um, porosity of, uh, of uh, bones and especially human bones if you look at uh, a human bone, uh, you will see that it's uh, completely porous. And so this is uh, in order to actually solve the trade-off of being both mechanically uh, very tough and uh, resistant, but light uh, also. Uh, and so this is indeed what stories uh, say, uh, says that uh, Gustave Eiffel took inspiration uh, from uh, human bones to actually think of the structure of the Eiffel Tower. Another example? Solar panels mimicking the, um, the flowers that... Uh, sunflowers? sunflowers? Yes, indeed, there are also examples <laughs> of uh, systems 
of uh, sunflower mimicking a solar panel so that to uh, you know optimize the yield of the solar panel so they are always in the right uh, direction regarding the sun yeah so another hand there yeah, here one, airplane. uh, the airplanes yeah just yeah uh, yeah there is also in some un u.s university they had to connect two buildings by pathways so building them first they just left it like a field and saw where people went and they left a path over time and on these paths they then built the actual um, pavements and it's uh, inspired from obviously uh, human nature yeah. Yeah. or hands ants, I would say ants, <laughs> ants, ants, which are doing indeed um, uh, marking. This is exactly the same idea that, uh, that, uh, that uh, ants are, are using for collective intelligence to finding the, the shortest path. Uh, and uh, we had uh, um, on the back example of airplanes. Of course, this is probably the industrial area in which, uh, let's say, mod modern uh, industrial uh, biomimicry appeared. Uh, it was like, let's say, even earlier in Leonardo da Vinci sketches, uh, and uh, and uh, the um, aircraft industry very early took inspiration from birds to optimize the shape of the wings, the shape of uh, uh, the aircraft, etc., etc. Okay, no other examples. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the process is not implemented yet but there are experiments on Hercules uh, and also African frog and the logic behind this experiment is that they can change their um, color so they can reflect sun especially efficient in like, hot uh, countries and they also um, behave like sponges <laughs> so they can uh, control their humidity level Yes, indeed, there are several studies uh, about, uh, especially dessert, uh, dessert, uh, dessert um, species. If I, if if we talk about the same one, uh, where you can find adaptations regarding both water management and optical and light management uh, regarding to the very specific dessert environmental constraint that you have, and so you have specific adaptations that can be used either to optimize. Uh, light harvesting and or water harvesting. And the last one? Uh, I think the Paris School of Economics has a <coughs> volume which is built on uh, the mechanisms that the human body uses to cool down uh, in, a, in a heated <coughs> atmosphere because they have panels on the windows which respond to heat inside the room and sunlight outside the room and they change directions to let wind in and out of the hall. Um, and it's the inspiration of it is based on the, the perspiration <coughs> of the body. It's not what the perspiration of the body is re re related to water evaporation. I think it's, it doesn't work anymore. I know that. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. not working some years back. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Because there are a lot of mechanical pieces in this building, and this is a good thing to understand it's not very resilient because it requires a lot of maintenance but indeed in the architectural field we we have a huge uh, issue related to uh, um, adapting uh, the buildings especially to light uh, income uh, when it's hot and so there are several experiment experimental envelopes to actually work on how to bring shade but adapt adaptive shade and so having adaptive <coughs> envelopes and in this field area, indeed, there are a lot of um, examples of, um, of biological, um, biological um, champions. So supernature, this is not new, again, uh, biomimicry, I, I guess uh, our ancestors, uh, even when we were hunters, probably, uh, probably already looked at nature uh, to see how to mimic <laughs> hunting strategies. So, uh, getting inspiration from nature has always existed uh, since humanity exists. Of course, you know, uh, I've, I've cited already Leonardo da Vinci. Um, <coughs> I should cite uh, more recent contemporary um, scientists like um, Pierre Gilles de Gênes. Pierre Gilles de Gênes is a French Nobel Prize in, um, in um, chemistry. And he, uh, and, uh, he was uh, really, uh, really enthusiastic about uh, interdisciplinarity and looking at how 
uh, nature works to, to, to bring new ideas to scientists in the other fields. And um, I highly recommend you the lecture of that book if you want to know more about biomimicry. And this is uh, the book that made me <laughs> Uh, get involved into the field of biomimicry. So Janine Binis is an American biologist and in, uh, in 1990 she published a book called Biomimicry and she describes how can living organisms not only inspire us like this kind of innovations but really be a game changer in terms of uh, a new trajectory uh, for uh, um, environmental transition. So looking at uh, natural systems uh, can learn and teach us and give us a path uh, through environmental transition. So why? Why? Because if you look at what is the... Uh, maybe you don't see. You see? Here in the back? Yeah, it's okay. Um, how and in which context does life work? Uh, how many species do we have on Earth? How many cohabitants do we have? Not in terms of individuals, but in terms of species. How many cohabitants do we have on Earth? We shall know. Hmm? <laughs> we shall know. Because, uh, yes. They shall know? It was like seven million. <coughs> we only know two million. Good, 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 good. So, 1.5 million. Wow. <coughs> yeah, so we, we, the, estimation, the estimation go from seven million to 100, uh, to 100 million <laughs> uh, species, depending on how you count them and if you extrapolate also to bacterial species and microbiological species uh, and indeed uh, only uh, 1.7 to 1.8 are actually described when we, when we say described it's just that at some point someone said okay this species i will tag uh, this species with a new name because it's different from a uh, some previous one it doesn't mean that someone has spent years describing it uh, so we have uh, so about two million species described, and yeah. And mostly we know more about uh, insects than other uh, everything else. <laughs> also because insects are probably the group that is the most represented in terms of uh, worldwide biodiversity. Also, so this is let's say proportional, but there is also let's say. Um, a bias, a cultural bias for humans, we way more like animals than we are interested in microbiology and plants. So there is also this bias that uh, we know more about animals because just we feel more interested in animals, not because they are more important. Um, uh, how old is life on Earth? Two when? Ho, 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 ho. No. I love asking this question because this is our most fundamental <coughs> history. Our biological most fundamental history. 500 million? Oh, no. When did life appear on Earth? 3.8 billion years. 3.8 billion years. When did the Homo sapiens, let's say, uh, Rosy species appear? about 250 and 300,000. Uh, so this is just a huge gap and this industrial revolution <coughs> is 200 years. So 200 years versus four, almost 4 billion years. And so during these 4 billion years, of course, through evolution, by trials and errors, several typology of systems. And when I talk about systems, I would almost say um, let's say thermodynamical systems. In that any uh, life system from the cell to an ecosystem could be modelized like a system with flows of energy, of matter, of information. So at any of these uh, scales, life has been optimized through evolution and always adapting to, to, to its environment. And so what lessons could be learned about the um, operating conditions in which life does everything that life does. So when you look at energy, 90%, 99% of all the energy entry on Earth and uh, to all the biomass that is around us, all the plants, all the animals, is solar energy. Solar energy, which is converted first by, of course, photosynthetic organisms and then they are eaten by herbivores and the herbivores are eaten by the carnivores and blah, 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 and you have the whole metabolic circle. So all life is transforming 
a flow, uh, an, uh, an energy flow to an energy stock. So from the waves, light waves, into stocks of energy, sugars, and, um, and lipids, grease. grease. So all life is based on solar energy in the very beginning. Uh, any li living organism is optimizing its uh, <coughs> consumption of energy. Uh, neither human species or a lot of other species do not eat all the time. Well, there are exceptions, but <laughs> not everyone is eating all the time. So you have at some point access to energy and then you have to deal with all the stocks you have. And so you have in a human body, you have plenty of stocks and depending on the effort, depending on what you're doing, you will be using the different stocks. And so life is used to optimize depending on the environmental conditions and is um, uh, is adapted to having, um, how do you say in English, intermittent, yeah? yeah, intermittent access to energy. So the sources are diversified, uh, and uh, CO2 is a basic brick for energy. The fuel, <laughs> the uh, biological fuel, the biofuel is based on CO2. <coughs> so CO2 for life is both the brick for energy and for materials building and we'll go to materials afterwards. And so when we have problem here now with green, uh, uh, greenhouses gas and the CO2, uh, CO2 expansion is because we are going to dig out from the soil uh, organic matter that has sequestrated CO2 for, uh, for uh, centuries and centuries and, and, and uh, thousands of years and we are just uh, putting it back uh, in, the, in, um, in the air, but with no capacity for the biomass to absorb it enough. In terms of materials, I won't go into details because I have a full, uh, a full section about this. <laughs> but let's say that the biological materials in their very high biodiversity, please, when you go outside tonight or this weekend, look at the nature uh, around you and look at the, the huge diversity of materials you have in nature. Just look at your human body. You have nails, you have uh, uh, hairs, you have, uh, you, you, you have skin, you have plenty of ma different materials. You have bones on, in, the, in a human body. And look outside, you'll see we have a huge variety of, human, of, um, of uh, biological materials. And these are, let's say, the grail of what any engineer in material sciences would love to do. Uh, we have almost the same properties uh, in uh, biological materials and we can have in, let's say, most of industrial fields. But of course, uh, biological materials are built of very abundant elements. Uh, we say that uh, they are built from the champs, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus and sulfur. This accounts for, let's say, 95% of biological materials. Uh, if, you have, if you remember a little bit your Mendeleev table of elements, uh, so uh, biology is using only a few of them, while, of course, the technosphere, <laughs> so human beings are very proud to use plenty of, uh, uh, of other elements, but what happens if we use that elements, biology is not uh, able to absorb it and to recycle it, so that's why we have this dead end that we are facing right now, using all this diversity of materials that we cannot recycle as easy as we can see. While in biology, because we have these very simple elements and, uh, and molecules which are built from these elements, they are way easier to be metabolized by other biological species. So chemistry, so you're not chemists here, I think. Uh, so abundant materials, but also another principle which is very interesting and common to any other, any biological species to only there are very, very few ex exceptions. Life runs at moderate temperature and pressure. So they do all these materials, they do all this stuff being at room temperature and pressure, ambient temperature and pressure, moderate. While, of course, you know that we're building uh, several types of materials using, using what is so-called heat, beat and treat. Uh, one only solvent, water, of course, while our chemistry is using plenty of other solvents. And uh, all this is uh, possible because there is one very specific phenomenon in biology. So this will bring you back a little bit uh, in your studies, which is ca catalysis, which is uh, helped by um, enzymes. Enzymes, is it okay for everyone? You all know what an enzyme is. 
If you look at information management, well, we are in a, in a society which is getting more and more digitalized to have access to information, to optimize, to optimize the flow. Actually, the fact that, uh, to me, human society is digitalizing is just, again, repeating the process of evolution. <laughs> uh, and so we can look at human society like a super biological macroorganism, which is itself optimizing its information management. Um, the smallest uh, piece of uh, information in the living world is DNA, yeah, DNA, the gene. Uh, and so uh, this is a very first, uh, of course, uh, uh, ancestor uh, molecule for life and information management molecule. And so what happened during evolution? This uh, DNA fragment then get, got a first kind of envelope. And once it got this first kind of envelope, it had to communicate with the environment. And so little by little, you had more and more sensors that were developed through the living and information management systems. And so uh, biology is very, very performant in terms of, of information management. We are, as human be beings, full of sensors. We have a brain, of course, which is very performant in terms of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of ICT, let's say technology <laughs> of information management. Uh, and uh, about DNA, there are simulations that were, have been proposed by uh, the Nature um, uh, scientific paper. And they estimated that if we had to store all the humanity knowledge, which is currently in the data centers, it will, how much do you think DNA we would need uh, to store? A bucket full of it. Hmm? A bucket full. One cell. Hmm? One cell. <laughs> No one cell, but one kilogram. So one line, one brick of milk, one bottle of milk. No. Yeah, it's a bottle. So it's, I found this just amazing. <laughs> and so that's why there are now companies trying to really develop an industrial field of uh, storing information on DNA, uh, which is quite stable uh, over time and not obsolescent because as far as <laughs> human beings are still here to manage this, uh, this technology, we will always be uh, able to manage DNA. And of course, I guess, I think you, 23 countries, uh, I guess probably most of you have had water problems during the last few months or will have water problems during the next centuries. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, sorry, sorry to be a little bit depressive, but yeah. And so, but, but, but what is uh, enthusiastic is that, uh, of course, any life organism has to deal with water. Uh, we talked earlier about dessert uh, species. Uh, we can also talk about tropical species. We have to, to, to deal with overabundance of water. There are plenty of species we have to, to deal with desalination that have to deal with purification of water, with distribution of water. And so, of course, there is also uh, a huge interest in to going uh, on how, our, uh, hum um, how biological organisms are, are able to deal with water. And so what is very interesting is that I wrote here the speci specifications of the living, <coughs> but if you make abstraction of, the, uh, of um, the fact that I'm talking about life, and you look at all the different pillars, there are almost exactly overlapping the strategies that our government and our industry is trying to build and to write. So the roadmap that they are trying to build is exactly congruent to what actually life systems have been doing for, for, uh, for billion years. And this is quite common sense and logical. Again, uh, trials and errors to be adapted to their environment. This is exactly <laughs> what we have to do as human species. So a few examples now. No, it doesn't work. No, no, no.
Alors, c'est ça qui... Ouais. Donc, alors, ça marche. Ah, ça va peut-être revenir. Ah, c'est bon, c'est bon, c'est bon, c'est revenu. Il m'a lancé un truc. Il m'a Ok. Sinon, je vais rester comme ça. Je vais rester comme ça, c'est pas grave. On va faire un paramètre d'affichage. Okay. ok, super, merci. Ouais. Ok, so that's that explain all these different um, uh, all these different uh, properties uh, that have been uh, described in uh, in biology. Explains why uh, uh, there is an increasing interest into the field of biomimicry. Uh, and so, because uh, life has actually performed uh, 4 billion years R&D, research and development, and it's adapted, doing it, being adapted to the environment. Uh, and so why now? Why, why uh, do we have this expansion of biomimicry uh, products and, uh, and applications for the last 30 years? You, you have to understand that uh, and realize <laughs> that we, our access and our capacity to get knowledge and how biology actually works is quite recent. It's only a few decades, it's from the last century. Uh, because we have instruments, because we have all the disciplines that also have been developing in parallel. So we have technical progress that helps us understand better how life works and we also have technical progress which help us to build actually stuff that looks like nature, because nature is really, really very sophisticated. We'll see it ex uh, especially uh, for the material sciences. And of course, there is uh, the ra <laughs> awareness raised about societal issues and the way that we have to innovate differently. And this is because of all these four factors that we see uh, the emergence of, um, of, bio of biomimicry. So, sorry it's in English, it's a French, uh, but I guess you understand, <laughs> almost. Uh, and so we have now examples in all the fields. So you have a super website available in English and public, which is called Ask Nature. You can, uh, you can write it, asknature.org. Uh, it's addictive, usually, <laughs> because you just, actually it's like, um, like a browser where you will, okay, I want, uh, for example, build, uh, find a new adhesive, I want to do, uh, I don't know, um, antibacterial surface, how does nature do, do this? <coughs> and so you have uh, plenty of examples on how nature do it and plenty of examples of, uh, of stuff on the market. So this is a very good first catalog of examples. Uh, these are resources in French. Uh, for the French speakers, you can go on uh, see BIOS website and you'll find plenty of resources, which are in French. Um, and so in the field of energy, uh, <coughs> you have plenty of small innovations, but I would say that the major innovation would be how to actually mimic what is happening in terms of chemistry. Uh, in the living world, I won't go again into details, but there is a huge uh, international research at the moment on how to produce hydrogen. I guess you all know that hydrogen like is a big promise but how to produce this molecule with a good yield and being uh, relevant in terms of an environment. So if it's not cost effective, <laughs> uh, both economically or environmentally to produce uh, hydrogen, so that's no point. And so actually uh, in biology, bi plants are able to split in their chemistry the water molecule, so um, H2O <laughs> uh, into, uh, into uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And so there are people around the world trying to crack that and uh, do actually systems to produce 
to produce um, to produce uh, hydrogen exactly the way that uh, plants do from water. And this is um, another strategy. I won't go into details. Again, uh, chemical uh, inspiration with uh, pigments, biological uh, inspired pigments to actually retrieve uh, energy from uh, from the sun, uh, which have been developed by Michael Gretzel in Switzerland. It's a, it's a, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit scary, but it's easy to understand. Don't worry. Uh, uh, so this is a CO2 molecule, and actually be doing bio inspiration because, uh, as I said earlier, CO2 is both the brick, basic brick to build materials and to do actually uh, bigger molecules to produce fuel. Uh, there are plenty again of research done to understand how do living organisms store and sequestrate CO2 and build bigger molecules so that we can recycle <coughs> atmospheric CO2 and to instead of just going and digging uh, uh, fossil fuels uh, from the ground how do we recycle the CO2 that is outside and, 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 do, uh, and do fuels. These are more easy uh, examples to understand in the, um, in the field of energy. Uh, you have uh, several turbines that have, been, uh, that have been developed inspired from the living world uh, both uh, marine turbines inspired from the, uh, from the movement of a lot of uh, different uh, marine organisms, the waving um, movement. Uh, so there is a French company call, called Il Energie or other people doing uh, wind, uh, wind uh, turbines inspired from the shape of, uh, of uh, living organisms which are actually uh, improving, improving the fluid mechanics around the, around the, the, um, around the uh, device. And as I said earlier, one of the most fascinating fields in the field of uh, biology and bioinspiration, and that's probably why worldwide uh, this is a domain which is the most studied domain. It's uh, it's a material sciences. So this is just, of course, a very small sample. Yeah. No, just uh, from before, and you said before, and uh, this research on how to extract CO two from the atmosphere and bind it again. Mm -hmm. It seems a little bit to me like wishful thinking. Are there any yeah. promising? Is there yeah, any yeah. promising research? Yeah, or? especially yes, there are very promising research, especially <laughs> getting the help from bacteria and biology. <laughs> so you take microorganisms, which uh, <coughs> is, uh, actually do the job for you. <laughs> they are the chemical plant <laughs> doing the job for you, and then you just retrieve the biofuel, uh, the bio biofuel coming from the either the um, algae. All the uh, all the bacteria uh, doing it, or they are completely artificial uh, chemical ways to do it. But yes, yes, they are, they are very interesting. Uh, um, um, not all, uh, not completely mature technologies, but uh, going to the market technologies to do that. So material sciences. Um, have you ever heard about the spider silk properties? Yeah? It's very light, very stretchy, but still very strong, strong. strong. Yeah. Yeah, and stuff. So it's um, uh, what is so-called in, in biology, uh, in, in, in chemistry, a polymer. Okay? And it's very, very indeed remarkable in terms of properties. And what is amazing is that once it's not needed anymore, the spider can even eat it and get uh, food again and just recycle it into, into a new <laughs> into a new um, into a new um, <coughs> new silk and uh, for uh, decades uh, engineers have been trying <laughs> to produce uh, industrial spider silk and it's not easy it's not like the um, the conventional silk that you all know uh, which is uh, which is actually uh, produced by a larva a larva from a butterfly which you can harvest actually and grow. Uh, you can't harvest uh, harvest uh, spiders and just have a small you know small bobbin to you know to reach with them. It's a little it's a little <laughs> complicated, and it will not be very cost effective. Uh, so they managed again with the help of bacteria to produce. Uh, so they cracked the gene responsible for coding for uh, this uh, molecule, uh, which composes a silk. And they, take, they took a bacteria, uh, one very, very common bacteria that is used in labs called Escherichia coli, E. coli, that you usually know it like this, uh, this way. And actually the bacteria is, uh, is producing the silk, uh, but it's like a soup. 
And it's exactly, then they have to actually, um, how do you say um, in English, TC? If someone can. Um, when you, when you, uh, it's the same thing than when you put closes and you have. Um, Neat, thank you. To knit it. To knit it. Uh, actually, um, in, uh, in the abdomen of the, um, of the, uh, of the spider, yeah, the, uh, the spider doesn't get, uh, you know, spider sick from, uh, from her legs. Uh, it gets spider sick from the abdomen. The, ab uh, the, the silk comes out from the abdomen. And in the abdomen, it's a soup. It absolutely doesn't resemble uh, like, a, like, a, like a, a string, absolutely not. And it's because there are chemical modification before the emission of the silk. And because actually, the look at the spider next time when she, she actually uh, uh, build the, um, her, her silk or um, the, the web, actually the spider will drag drag the glue. So this is, uh, it's not a glue, but it's, um, it's like a sticky, sticky substance. It will drag it. And because there is traction, because there is humidity in the air, because the, there is oxygen in the air, uh, the, the substance will completely change and be transformed into this just remarkable, remarkable uh, material. And this is exactly what this uh, German company did. So they made the soup from the, from the bacteria and then they just uh, drag it and change the constraints and change the environment and do exactly that like the spider does. So spider silk and like I'm silk started to produce the silk like only five to six years ago. So we know the properties of the silk for decades and it's only five to six years ago that a company managed to crack and to do it. Um, do you know, try to guess what this could be. This is a section, transversal section of a biological organism. What could it be? It's obviously a tube, it's a tube of something. What could it be? So I'll give you a, a it's a very resistant mechanically and very light. No, it's a plant. It's a plant. Bamboo. It's a bamboo. So all the dark uh, color is void. All the dark is void and you have matter only where it's blue and violet. Green and violet there. So when I said about the bone earlier, uh, inspiring the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> this is the same idea about bamboo. You have only material where you have a physical constraint. So during the growth of the vegetal or the plant or during the growth of a bone, the cells which uh, function is to deposit matter <laughs> and build the matter and build the molecule of the matter, they put matter only when you have a where you have a physical constraint. And so that's why you, have, you can reach this trade-off of being both very light and both very resistant. Uh, I love these ideas of having different strategies to build colors. Usually um, warm colors in the living are made of uh, uh, pigments. So all the yellow, orange, red are made of uh, pigments, so molecules. While <laughs> all the cold <laughs> colors, green, blue, are made of structure. It's a structure which interacts with the light and the structure itself uh, physically modifies the wave, the wave uh, filtrates the, the wavelengths. And if you look at, for example, at the small scale of um, this morpho wing butterfly, this is a morpho wing butterfly. This is a very beautiful iridescent butterfly that you usually can see in museums or if some of you have been in tropical areas, you can find them. So it's a very nice blue, completely iridescent. Uh, and so if you look, you have this comb-like structure and it's a very, very small and it's, that, it's so small and exactly the right size to interfere with the light <laughs> and bring the blue color. So when I say that biological organisms are very sophisticated, uh, it's, it's a very good example. And so you have for all the different materials only the five elements, almost only the five elements I've been talking earlier to do all this. So biology is a remarkable architect and a material architect. But of course, there are manufacturing issues. How do we do to, to, to build this? Just a few examples of <coughs> industrial applications. 
and or things that are currently under development. <coughs> one of the most famous, no one, no one thought about, uh, talked about it earlier, one of the most famous examples of biomimicry is a uh, lotus leaf. So in a lot of botanical gardens and even city gardens, uh, you have uh, in, um, in, uh, in small ponds, you have this uh, lotus. Uh, the lotus, um, the lotus, uh, it's usually this size leaves, and they are completely repellent, water repellent. So, and it's very funny to do. Just really, really do it. You just put water in it, and it will. The drop will just roll, uh, way better than the roll on a like a shell, uh, a Gore-Tex shell. So, and this uh, has been explained. Uh, there is a very specific composition of the surface and topology of the surface of the lotus leaf, and it has been deployed. Both for uh, uh, both for um, to avoid uh, drop formation on glasses and or to develop paintings. Um, this is another example of amazing surfaces, <coughs> carnivorous <coughs> plants, and this is a, especially the nepenthes structure. And uh, this plant, uh, it's carnivorous. So the idea is that any insects or uh, living being coming here around, if it drops in cannot go out. So even if, the, even if the legs are greasy or humid, it shouldn't go out. So it had to sleep with any kind of uh, interaction, whatever there is on the, on the, on the, um, on the legs. And this has been developed um, at uh, Harvard, uh, um, uh, hosted with Wyss Institute. The Wyss Institute is one of the most uh, powerful uh, research and innovation center in the field of biomimicry related to especially chemistry and, and, um, and material sciences. And, uh, and uh, they managed to actually develop surfaces which will be slippery to anything. And it could be very interesting for anti-fouling system. Uh, you know what anti-fouling is? You, uh, it's, uh, for example, when boats are for a long time uh, underwater uh, very, uh, very quickly, you have a lot of uh, biological organisms that will come and stick on the boat. And this, uh, this really is a huge problem because the drag uh, is very high and so you just waste a lot, a lot of energy efficiency. And it's a high cost of maintenance and or using very bad chemicals to, to fight it. So this could be used for anti-fouling or to do or for um, um, food industry, when you do industrial food, you have huge reservoir of food and every time you do a batch of food, then you have a plenty of food leaving left on the, on, the <coughs> on the systems you use and so you have to clean them, to bleach them and blah 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 and so this would be a good way to do it. And this is a very nice one. Um, does anyone know this example? Uh, it's a desert beetle. Where do you have water in desert? In the air, in the air. <coughs> you have a lot of water in the air. And so what does this beetle? Is that, uh, so during night, uh, its cuticle gets very cold because it's cold during night. So the organism is cold. It climbs up <laughs> to reach the first array of, uh, of, um, of sun. So its cuticle gets uh, hotter, but the air is still uh, humid. Uh, and, and cold, so it condensates. It condensates on the on the on the cuticle of uh, of uh, this uh, beetle, and this is a very specific surface. There are I won't go into details. Very specific surface that accelerates actually the condensation, and gathers all the drops, and so he just uh, put his uh, head down, and all the drops are, are going to its uh, to his mouth, and so he has his uh, his uh, his uh, water for the day just using water coming from, uh, from the air. And so there are systems currently developing <coughs> to get water in very hot environments using <coughs> this uh, way of harvesting water. What do you think this is? Hmm? It's <coughs> yeah, it seems quite complicated, but what can it be? It's the energy cycle of the cell. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, usually there's more, you know, it's just other propositions, but you found the answer <laughs> too, too fast. So usually people say, oh, this is a, uh, this is a subway, blah, 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 or this is a chip. 
uh, you know, a chip, uh, a computer chip? No. Okay. Indeed, very, it's not exactly the, 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 the good answer, but actually what I show you here is a molecule, and so these are pathways, chemical pathways, described in a cell. And it's just a snapshot. The uh, image is way bigger. And it was like 10 years ago. So this is happens in a cell which is one micro cube meters. So, okay. so when we say earlier chemistry in the living is just amazing, any chemist should go, <laughs> should go and learn about biology because this is just, we are absolutely not able to do that, of course, today. And I, say, I told you earlier, remember your Mendeleev table? Uh, the, uh, the, <coughs> the yellow ones are the ones that are mostly used in biology, then there are trace elements, and, also, and eventually a few other elements. Life doesn't use any of other elements. And if you overlap the relative abundance of these elements in the environment, so in soil, in earth, air, and water, in direct environment, you have an almost perfect overlap of what, of what biology is using and what is abundant immediately locally. So this is, again, quite of a learning. And you have, um, I will let you look at what she does more specifically. She, uh, Claude Rison is a French, sorry, it's quite uh, French centered uh, <laughs> examples. But um, so Claude Rison is a, uh, it's a French researcher, but which received, she receives a prize for the European inventor uh, in 2022. And she developed a bio inspired way to actually uh, clean the soils from heavy metals. Uh, and to actually be able to retrieve these metals and uh, use them again in chemistry and do a way greener chemistry. So it's win-win from both sides, but you depollute and you do uh, a better chemistry afterwards. So I really recommend you to go and look on what she does. And I really love this slide. And now I go to the information um, <coughs> management. <coughs> uh, this is a study that has been published by researchers in the University of Bass that they were trying to see how does nature actually deal with problem solving compared to humans. So where we usually, again, go heat, beat and treat once we have a problem, uh, life uses mostly information management to actually deal and to solve a problem. So again, that's not completely absurd that our society is going more and more digitalized because we hope to do actually this kind of things. This is a DNA, yeah? When you say life uses information, uh, as opposed to the heat, heat, and heat, um, how does that materialize? And it's, uh, it means that because there is a very high um, information flow in, in the living world, they do, not have its, uh, they do not have to go and search for uh, materials far away. They do not have uh, to... Uh, uh, to move uh, away uh, quite long, uh, quite uh, far, because actually they manage that well information that they they don't. Everything is optimized at the ecosystemic level. That's why I say now that we have all these apps, that actually okay, I need this, I can find it there. <laughs> actually, all the apps are currently doing this. This is exactly what's happening anyway in the living world. And uh, you have actually biomimicry inside in most of your smartphones, uh, in all the apps which are optimizing the passes, the pathways. For example, what is the shortest uh, way to go this, uh, this, uh, uh, to this place? This is exactly, again, this is the example you gave earlier about the ants. Um, the complex math that have been developed uh, in the last centuries were really looking at nature to understand how swarms ants, bees are working, how neuronal uh, networks are working and trying to implement this in math and then uh, in computer sciences. You plug everything I've told you so far, energy management, uh, material sciences, uh, information management, and you can go to bigger scales than the product scale. You can go to a bigger product, which is, let's say, the infrastructure. And so that's no surprise that like Mick Pierce for in Zimbabwe, a lot of other architects have used bioinspiration and biomimicry to improve energy efficiency, to improve water management, light source structure, and blah, blah, blah. So these are all examples of stuff that are either built or, uh, or experimental, <coughs> but there are now plenty of examples of bioinspired architecture 
uh, worldwide. Another ex other examples here. I won't go into details. Uh, and uh, <coughs> you go to other systemic levels. Agriculture. We will have an issue in terms of food management in the few uh, next, uh, next decades. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, um, I think that the way we are growing food right now and having like one species for hectares and hectares doesn't resemble, a, 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 absolutely doesn't resemble to any uh, biological ecosystem you can see. Uh, and so that's why uh, little by little we see uh, now agriculture getting more and more interested in understanding the interaction between species in an, in an ecosystem and trying to reproduce agricultural ecosystems, so putting back life in soils, uh, mixing plants, uh, smaller plants and trees, and having insects and regulating insects differently. Uh, and so what is interesting in uh, biomimicry is that you can go, this is like a summary about the way you can apply biomimicry, either a functional approach, so you can buy the work on uh, like Mick Pierce on uh, thermic function, thermal function, etc. You can have an ecosystemic approach and you can even have a territorial approach. So this is the most mature one because it's easier. The perimeter is small. This starts to be more complicated. We like even, uh, let's say, scientific analogies and background. And the territorial approach is even more complicated, but this is really, uh, to me, uh, the most interesting part. It has to help to more territories to be more resilient and more adapted to the uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to, a, uh, to a climate change. And there are now initiatives trying to work at, at the territorial levels of biomimicry, trying to understand how ecosystem work at a bigger scale and how could, be, could we be inspired from these bigger scales to do it. Uh, I really love these examples. There is either the French company Pocheco, uh, and or you have another example, maybe you have heard about it, Interface. You know the interface, it's a carpet company, very famous uh, because it's probably one of the most uh, um, um, uh, ecological <laughs> uh, uh, company worldwide. They went from the product, uh, <laughs> they went from the product to the territorial uh, actually integration of their factory um, in terms of uh, ecological transition. And so uh, Pocheco is uh, about the same thing. Uh, and so the, this is an envelope um, um, factory. And so they are really interested and in pay attention to the forest from uh, which these uh, uh, envelopes are there. They have optimized through bio-inspired processes uh, the um, uh, ink uh, composition. So it's completely organic, no more toxic uh, pigments in their ink. Uh, it's all uh, in a water solvent, you remember, water solvent. Uh, and uh, the product was not enough, and they said, okay, our factory should be also just exemplary. And so they worked on, um, on uh, energy, uh, so they have solar panels, they have uh, a transpiration, as uh, you said earlier, so evapotranspiration to cool the building. Uh, all the water all the water is recycled on, the, on uh, the factory site and they host, I don't know, thousands of different species of plants and insects on the, uh, um, on the building site. They have agricultural field and the uh, farmers are, are employees from the company. Uh, so I really love that examples of different scales of implementing bio-inspired or bio, let's say, regenerative strategies. And so there are other fields of implementation, implementation of biomimicry, but they are rather a metaphor so far and not really a model because science is not mature enough uh, about uh, organizations and management. You have plenty of different types of organizations in the living world, like, uh, like pollination, uh, uh, like uh, uh, ant, <coughs> collective intelligence and collective management, uh, like in monkeys, different typology of monkeys, but it's quite metaphoric so far. And it's quite dangerous also, because you have all the different types of organizations in the, in the living world, either altruist modes or completely dictatorial. You have uh, matriarchal <laughs> organizations, patriarchal organizations. So anyone can find an organization that suits it. Uh, and so, but what is interesting <coughs> in the living world is the 
adaptive organization of almost any organizations, and also the fact that any organization is completely adapted to its size, to uh, the stakeholders <laughs> with which this organization works. And we rather see, it's not completely true, but kind of a standard in human organizations, whatever whatever and wherever you, you live and whatever is work and field you work in, usually it's standardized. And what is a learn, bigger learning, I think, in, uh, in, in life strategies, in, you know, any organization is adapted to exactly what it has to do. A new business model, so this is again even more metaphoric. So let's say the circular economy, so this is a big metaphor of, uh, okay, how do we close uh, loops and how do we recycle everything and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this is again very metaphoric. And so to finish, just a few elements of context. So I'll just give you here a very small, small overview of what is biomimicry, few examples, major fields and blah. Uh, but uh, it's not just like a trend. And because it's a fancy trend, wow, it's a sexist thing. No, no. There is really, a really, um, <coughs> a huge trend into, in terms of uh, scientific publications. Oh, I did the graph in uh, mid-2023, <laughs> so that's why uh, the graph for 2023 only, only half of it. So you have a huge increase in terms of uh, um, scientific publications. Uh, it's the same thing uh, for patenting. So, and it's probably um, underestimated because uh, in patents you don't have to write that it's bio-inspired. You just have to write that this process is, is to be patented. The fact that it's bio-inspired, no one cares. So uh, usually it's not written in the patents. And we, there is a um, quite also in growing uh, context in, uh, in uh, worldwide. Uh, in the USA, as I said earlier, you have the bigger institute uh, for bio-inspired uh, bio, uh, engineering, um, which is uh, so working um, uh, with uh, um, Harvard University. And uh, it's mostly, as I said, related to chemistry. Uh, and in Europe, um, so Europe accounts for at least 40% of all world publications in the field. So, um, uh, so and especially Germany. Germany has started a real uh, governmental strategy in favor of biomimicry bio in, um, in early uh, 2000. And so now you have several centers dedicated to uh, uh, research centers and innovation centers dedicated to uh, biomimicry in Germany. And you really have a strategy for that. And you have almost the same trend in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, for the French ones uh, in the room, uh, we have everything to be successful. We just need a little bit of organizations and, of, uh, and money. But uh, I can discuss <laughs> that with you uh, later on. But uh, we're not that far from Germany and, and Switzerland. And so a few words on, okay, now I'm a company, uh, I'm an organization, I would like to get involved into biomimicry, how do I do? How do I do? Uh, so just a few words about CBIOS. So CBIOS is a French center uh, dedicated to the deployment of biomimetics at the national level. And so we work with all the different stakeholders needed to deploy this uh, biomimicry. So we work with researchers from biology, from physics, from chemistry, from human sciences, eventually. So we work with the academic field, we work with the companies, and uh, let's say the end users, more globally, which can be companies, which can be, uh, uh, which can be also the public sector. We work with, uh, <coughs> with educational uh, actors, like uh, universities, uh, and we also work with public policies, because to be successful, into the deployment in, uh, in uh, this like, almost new field, we have to work and to actually gather all these different stakeholders. And so these are a bunch of stakeholders we've been uh, working on, uh, which are ma mostly major international corporations and uh, also uh, public policies. And so um, part of our job is really to work with these people and say, okay, th I have a challenge help me to find the right biological model of interest and what can I imagine as an innovation to actually uh, solve my challenge. This is globally how it works. Uh, so you would say probably that in a team, okay, you need the engineer, let's say the end user, 
but probably you're talking about biology and biomimicry, you need the biologist. Okay, this, quite, this seems quite obvious. <coughs> but if you put only the end user in the biologist, nothing happens. Nothing happens. The miracle rarely happens. And so you need people who are able to understand both languages, both the language from the end user and the language of the biologist. And so you need people from interdisciplinary curricula. And I don't know in our fields, in your fields, how it is, but usually it's not the case. You very uh, rarely, uh, especially in science, which I know better, um, you, you rarely have interdisciplinary background, and especially related to biology. In France, biology, even if you are a scientific, uh, from a scientific background, can be stopped even before, uh, before, uh, before the end of your, let's say, basic studies for the French ones. Uh, <coughs> Uh, au lycée, uh, you, you don't even need to, to study biology if you don't want anymore, even if you are a scientist. So how do you want to do biology then, <laughs> and to do biomimicry if you do not know anything more about biology? So these interdisciplinary profiles are very precious, but they are very rare. So there are now trainings dedicated to, to actually develop these kind of profiles. And even if you have these three first profiles, there is still one missing, the creative one, the creative one. Because you, usually it's so disruptive, and this is so difficult for the end users to project, okay, I see that model, okay, now how could this be applied to my, uh, to my uh, issue, really? And so you need the creative background, and usually these are the designers. In, let's say in the industrial field. So now we almost always work with de designers to actually think differently. This could be the architect for um, the designer could be the architect in the building sector, the one that gets all the information and has to be that creative to, to actually draw a first concept. And then on that concept, everyone will be able to react and to build a project. If you do not have the architect, it's very difficult to have something, a concept. <coughs> Uh, you need very robust tools and methods if you don't do it properly. Honestly, it doesn't work. So you need uh, to, have, uh, to, to be good at uh, innovation management, to be good into multifunctionality, multi problem solving. And if you go to environmental transition, you have to also work on eco-design and uh, life cycle analysis and all these different tools which are currently developed to do that. And so we, for example, are very... Uh, Humbly, we, um, we did several PhD studies to actually work on these tools and methods to be as robust as possible to work with the different actors. But the major trigger, the major one, is okay, I don't know nothing, I know, I know nothing about biology, but I, don't, I want to be involved in biomimicry. Or even us, when we have to do a research and try to find the right examples in biology. Okay, there are millions, billions of articles describing biology. How do I find the right one? How do I know if I look to marine biology, to plants, which scale do I look to? Uh, which stage of development do I look to, uh, to the seed or do I look to the adult plant? Do I look to the larva or to the butterfly, blah, blah, blah. To the caterpillar or to the butterfly. So it's very difficult. Uh, and so that's why um, we uh, launched a project, quite ambitious project, with the Natural History Museum of Paris. The Natural History Museum of Paris is about 600 researchers and 70 million, 70 million specimens, which are, just, which are just sleeping in the cupboards. So no one is doing anything with all these different specimens, or almost no one is doing nothing. Uh, all biologists are studying them, but no engineers are looking at the mechanical properties of uh, the shells, or the bones, etc. So no one is looking at that. And so what we are trying to do is both to ourselves build new knowledge about all these different specimens and also building an artificial intelligence tool that be able to retrieve relevant information through all these million of uh, million and billions of articles. So that's what we are trying to do. If you looked through the Ask Nature website, what we are trying to do is to automate actually the Ask Nature website for those who are curious to, to look at. If you want to go further, you can go on our, um, on, uh, on our website, most of them we are, we are really doing an effort to translate them as soon as possible. Most of them, sorry, are in French. Uh, but we, you have few resources in, in English. And uh, if you want resources in English, you have <coughs> the Biomimicry Institute, the American 
let's say, our homologue in the United States, <coughs> which has plenty of resources. The, this Biomedical Institute is the one that actually uh, triggered the Ask Nature website I've talked, of, I've talked about. So you can go and look and look at it. And for those who will be in Paris in June, <laughs> in June 2024, this is the only exhibition dedicated to biomimicry worldwide. <laughs> worldwide. Uh, and it will be a XXL version of, um, of it. You will have all the different stakeholders, the startups, the students, the researchers, the companies, the public policies there. Uh, and, uh, and it will be nice because, of course, we'll do an echo to the Olympic Games so, and to how nature can be a, also a champion. <laughs> Uh, so, you're very welcome if you want to come in June. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so we have just minutes for questions. Yeah, I question. took several questions during the time. Yeah. Okay, thank you for an interesting presentation. Um, with the advancement in machine learning, we can now efficiently handle but also, uh, due to ecological crisis, we are losing biodiversity. How would you evaluate the future of my environment in the current context? Um, if I understand well, your, your question is, as we have like a sixth extinction of biodiversity, how do we deal with uh, biomimicry? Yes, indeed. This is a... Uh, <laughs> This is a speed a struggle <laughs> to do that. No, and almost, uh, mostly I would say that to us, biomimicry is a new and very enthusiastic way of saying we have to preserve biodiversity because any species that is disappearing is a reservoir of ideas that could be, a, uh, that could be, um, uh, that could be, a, um, that could be used. So we cannot alone <laughs> struggle against this biodiversity loss. We are trying to build projects that are regenerative. I didn't go into details in that, at that scale, but biomimicry could be used to also regenerate biodiversity, regenerate reefs underwater so that biodiversity can, can, uh, can again uh, re-emerge. Do a new type of agriculture, because agriculture is a huge biodiversity killer, killer at the moment. So if we do agriculture differently, and if we did by inspired agriculture, agriculture, probably we would slow down our biodiversity loss. So I see in biomimicry both an opportunity to say, okay, we could, through biomimicry, reduce the impact, <laughs> maybe regenerate a little bit. We won't so solve all the problems, but yeah, this is also an argument to say, okay, we first depend for anything about biodiversity, but also intellectually to find new, idea, new ideas. So this is my best answer to that question. <laughs> Yep. Here. Okay. Okay. Here. Here. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I mean, your presentation is kind of like a bait to somebody like me because um, I don't know how many people um, resonate with the feeling, but I personally feel like um, studying um, economics over the past few years kind of killed your. Um, hobbies and you feel like you're out of talent and <laughs> something like this is actually, um, I don't know, it's, it's really inspirational um, and I, I consider this the fault of the education system that I come out of because it's impossible for you to study biology unless you also sign up to study physics and chemistry and mathematics with it. Um, <coughs> so it's impossible for you to uh, bring together um, bio-imagination or bio um, unless you sign up to be a scientist when you're 15 years old. So, um, but something like this um, is very relevant in the current context of also the climate transition because um, also a lot of examples that we were all talking about in the beginning uh, are, you know, designed to be energy efficient, they're designed to avoid food wastage, they're designed to um, economize on transmission losses, power consumption, so many climate related um, outcomes. Uh, but something like that seems very unachievable with the current um, you know, skill set that people have. And I mean, as somebody who's working in the field, as a professional who's succeeded at doing something like this, how do you think um, we could be part of it because um, 
at this point, like, if I ask myself a question, how can I be a part of this? The only answer I get is maybe do a degree in architecture or do a degree in... Uh, no, no. Uh, biomimicry, uh, I didn't talk about all the... Um, all the, uh, the breaks and obstacles to biomimicry, but a lot of obstacles are um, finding the right business models for these uh, disruptive uh, products and technologies and approaches. Uh, is also, um, I mean, um, as any, if you can, biomimicry is facing all the problems that a disruptive innovation field uh, faces. And so all these disruptive innovation fields needs uh, also evolution in terms of business models and also needs the help of finding new business models. So I think I would say that people from economical background could help actually these processes uh, to, be, um, uh, to be under the light and to be favored in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of, 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 uh, of implementation in society. And the second thing is, as I said, uh, the field is almost uh, um, unexplored in terms of uh, um, how could biology inspire the field of economics itself. And so there could be things to be imagined and to be explored, and we need people willing to do it. So this could be also a way to say, okay, how could biology actually inspire my own field? And in the field of economics, there, are almost, there is almost nothing. So this could be a contribution. Yeah. It's okay. I see all the. It's okay for you as an answer. Okay. So, um, so like this, my comment, like my comment question should be a bit provocative because I, I, I saw <coughs> that you presented like a lot of uh, good innovations that are based mm -hmm. uh, in biology, but the thing is that they are also responsive responding to the market system and mm -hmm. to only some like the benefit of the profit seeking benefit of these companies that are producing so um, so my question would be uh, and also kind of you pointed out the agriculture like in, in, I come from Mexico and we like in Mexico in the, the, there is a specific uh, indigenous way of agri agriculture, which is like sustainable, it's called chinampa. Um, basically, like it's like nobody is doing it like right now because like it's not uh, cost like cost efficient and it, it doesn't go with the market, whatever. So what like my my comment or my question would be like, how do you think that as a biologist, as a scientist, do you think that these innovations would be like uh, like good enough or like good to like going against climate change and to like demitigate climate change because like uh, yeah yeah that's kind of like um I'm not pretty sure I understood well your question, to be honest, but uh, to me is that, uh, okay, this is a big promise, but uh, do we really think this would be the case? This is my bet, honestly. Um, my main concern <coughs> is not that the potential of the field is not there, is do we have enough time? Do we have enough time? Uh, sorry, again, to be a little bit just no, passive. Yes, because uh, but because observing, uh, explaining, describing a biological species takes time. Uh, bridging the gap and trying to find an application in another field takes time. And we do not have much time. Um, so uh, my main concern is um, um, this will be a long-term anticipation. So we have to start now to study all these biological species to little by little get more and more examples within the next decades. So probably the effects would be a little bit later, but you already have innovations. For example, the hydrogen production. If we really do CO2 sequestration and hydrogen production efficiently with a high yield using bioinspired approaches, this could have a high, very high impact, very, very high impact. In agricultural fields, uh, of, of course, if you change all, all the agricultural, all, all agriculture, it will take a, a little time. Uh, but uh, this is happening anyway, already. 
agriculture is changing anyway, and, uh, and the farmers themselves see that it can't last uh, this way. So it can continue this way. So agriculture is changing, but already, already, even if in, in <coughs> conventional, <coughs> already in conventional agriculture, you have alternatives to the pesticides. You have alternatives to pesticides mm -hmm. which have been already market on the that are already in the market using biomimicry, with a very low impact on biodiversity. So this is already a good step, a good step towards this. And I will just go back to. My first slide, um, one of my first slides, about the specifications of the living, you know, you remember this was this table. What we're trying to now do with a lot of uh, industrial actors is say, okay, forget about technology or the innovation, uh, let's say, uh, le forget about the um, uh, biomimicry applied to build a new product. Forget, it will take you years. Okay, you can do it. But meanwhile, <laughs> if you want to have a high impact, look at the specifications. Are you ambitious enough in terms of environmental goals in your company? And so more and more, we, uh, are you uh, ambitious enough in terms of life cycle analysis in your company? And so the more and more we are working with companies, the more and more we are going to these specifications for environmental um, management and impact and say, okay, are you ambitious enough? And you could do very innovative things, being more ambitious in terms of environment and just assembling originally technologies that already exist. So biomimicry could be used both for a product, for product management, but also like a, a roadmap. What would be my bio-inspired roadmap? And the roadmap is easier actually to reach and to get than the product one and the research and blah, blah, blah. Okay. okay. Um, <coughs> so um, my question is a bit more about the materials themselves. And, um, from what I understood, the, the champs, uh, carbon, uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, mm -hmm. they are all non-metals with the valence level around four to six with the exception of mm -hmm. hydrogen. That's, I think that's special. Um, and of course, availability seems to be a big part of it, but there are other elements that are wi widely available, uh, like um, silica. Yeah, called? they are quite used uh, in the living world. Or, or um, um, calcium that are not that used. So, is there? A they are very used, actually. Is there a particular um, property of those big five or six elements that? Um, that makes them a part of everything? Yes, because they are so-called organic materials, uh, organic mo mo molecules, and so they are actually um, usually uh, composing all the soft tissues in all the living worlds, while all the silicates and, carbon and calcium uh, elements are used in the living world, but to build the hard Bone. part, the bones, and all uh, the cuticles and the shells, uh, the shells uh, of the mollusk. And if we have concrete uh, rocks near the seas and under the seas is because of the accumulation of actually biomineralized materials <coughs> that have been built by biologists. So silicates and calcium and other elements are highly used in the living world. So I, I don't know if, I, if this is an answer to your question or not. Well, well, but what was the corporate, why those particular six, the champs, why, why are they so common if there's anything, if it's just availability or if they have any particular chemical properties? That they are them? both very available and indeed they have very particular chemical properties that uh, I won't do a chemical course, but uh, that indeed uh, make it possible to build polymers, to build all the diversity of molecules and uh, soft molecules that you have in the living world. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'm just. Uh, I would just want to hear all the questions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering. So if I understand the biomimicry process, it starts with finding something in nature that you would mm -hmm. like to copy, mimic, and then what I still have a lot of questions about is that actual process of then mimicking it, because uh, the way that nature produces the <coughs> materials, let's say, is vastly different from how we then actually yeah. produce them and copy them. <coughs> so. How promising do you think it is to try to copy the production process of nature? And do you think that that's a very hard constraint if we cannot copy it and have to find other ways to produce yeah. this material? So actually you can mimic nature from different perspectives. You can mimic just the result. 
So, okay, I just find these materials in terms of composition and topology is really nice. I'll just try to do the same thing, but with completely different processes. You could do that. Or you could copy only the process. Okay, oh, uh, there, are, there are organisms, marine organisms, that are able to produce glass at room temperature and pressure. And so they are mimicking now the processes of how do can, could we also build this is my timer. How could we uh, uh, build actually uh, glass and produce glass at room temperature and pressure? So you mimic the process, but you also could do both. So say, okay, for example, the lotus, the lotus effect. Uh, they did conventional chemistry to produce a painting that will have the same effect as the lotus <coughs> effect. But you could also say, oh, but they never actually, so far as far as I think, use the same uh, chemistry as uh, life do. Tomorrow, this could be also an objective to say, okay, if we want our chemistry to be cleaner, we could bo both try to do, mimic the results <laughs> of the process and the process itself. Uh, and the second layer of my, uh, of my answer would be that in, but I don't have, t I didn't have time to present it here. Through all the methodology of biomimicry, you do abstractions twice. When you have your industrial challenge, uh, it's, it's obvious that your exact industrial challenge do not have an exact uh, similarity in what could be found in the, the living world. So you have to say, okay, for example, I want to, to develop a new adhesive. Well, if you had to abstract it and to interrogate the living system differently, we say, okay, how does life assemble stuff? And then if you ask the question this way, you have a wide variety <laughs> of, of, uh, of strategies to do it, plenty of other strategies. So the first, uh, so, so the first step which you do this high abstraction is, okay, going from the industry to biology. And then, okay, you look to all different models, blah, 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 blah. You find a biological model which is of interest. Of course, as a lotus effect, you cannot copy and paste it directly. It's obvious. So you have to do a second abstraction a reverse abstraction to say, okay, now I've understood how it works. I've understood why this lotus surface is so effective. I've really understood what is the physical chemical principle behind it. I won't do exactly the same one. I know what the principle is. I abstract it. And now I found an industrial way of doing it. So, but you, you're right. You need abstraction. Otherwise, it's, it can, it's never a copy and paste. One very last question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it seems that all of this process is very experimental, of course, and for the point of view of like financiers, it's very high risk. So can you talk about a bit how, how is this all financed? Is it mostly coming from the public sector or are we seeing interest in private sector as well? Uh, we have both. We have both. The so public sector is both uh, giving subsidies to develop uh, high risk research. Uh, again, for this thing, this is exactly the same thing than any disruptive innovation where you have high risk, so you have all the exactly the same uh, mechanisms ongoing. And uh, this is to actually address the risk and the cost and to reduce the risk and to reduce the cost of exploratory <laughs> thing. This is why we launched this project with the Natural History Museum actually around the table. We have, uh, so far, we have six to uh, five to six corporations. Tomorrow, we want to have 30 to 40 to 50 to 100. And so everyone is putting cash, <laughs> a little bit of cash, but uh, <coughs> accessing then a wide range of data. And uh, so you reduce the risk, you reduce the cost by, uh, by cooperating and, uh, and, and, gathering, uh, and gathering and working together to, uh, to this exploratory uh, phases. So this is a way to actually uh, uh, lower the risk and lower the costs. I have to catch my train, sorry. And read Janine Binius' book.